Ciao, I am Nick Stellino. Today we're making rigatoni with bolognese ragu. This is a dish from my youth. I absolutely love it, and I will tell you what makes a ragu bolognese special. We'll follow them with strawberries, with zabaglione and orange liqueur. Please, join me in the kitchen. When you want to know about tomatoes, you got to talk to the expert. And I got my expert right here. Ray, how are you? Such a pleasure to see you. Thank you again. Why don't you tell us about these tomatoes? These tomatoes are San Marzano's. They come from the Vesuvian Plain in Italy. Exactly. And they are, make a great paste tomato. Ah, stop for a second. I want to tell you this. Why is that these tomatoes make the best sauce tomatoes? Because they have very few seeds. That proves the point. You see, you don't get this told a whole lot. Tomatoes, different kind of tomatoes have different purposes for making sandwiches, for making soup, for making sauces. These tomatoes, the San Marzano tomatoes, are gold. As a matter of fact, they make the best sauces ever. Now, Ray, most people will get afraid, but is this something very difficult to grow in your garden? No, it's not. The only issue it really has is it takes a little long to mature and we crush the season here. Well, one of the things that you have to realize is that you've done all this by yourself, right? Yes. And look, as you can see behind us, this beautiful towers of tomatoes. I'm going to grab a few of those. I'm going to bring it back to my own kitchen. And Ray, one of the things that I'm very concerned about you is that you're a little bit too thin. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a beautiful sauce. I'm going to put it over rigatoni. You come to my house for dinner tonight. Is that All a right, deal? Yeah. It's a deal. I'm taking two bushel of tomatoes. <laughs> it's a deal, right? It's a deal. OK, we're done. Look at this beautiful meat, huh? Pork, veal, and beef. That's exactly what we need to make rigatoni with bolognese ragu. What makes this sauce called ragu bolognese? I'll tell you the secret in just a second. But first, let's take a look at this pasta. These are rigatoni. Rigatoni are different from penne. As you can see, they're perfectly cylindrical. There is no slant cut. Then they have ridges on the outside. They're ideal for the sauce because they capture every single drop of it. So we got the pot full of water going. We get these guys going. Next. We make the sauce. What makes the sauce? The sauce, as all sauces, begins with the beginning of sofrito. Onion, celery, carrots. This is known as il triumvirato, the triumvirate. This is at the base of any sauce that you see me making. But it's not because I've invented this flow. This is exactly the reason why I do it, is that my mom made it this way, my grandma made it this way. If every Italian chef worth his salt, or her salt, makes it exactly this way. A technique now that I'm going to show you is interesting because it throws a little slant. And it is the process of ingredients that we're going to add. First, because I'm Sicilian, I'm going to add a little bit of red pepper flakes to give it some flavor, some spice, some bite. The next thing that I'm going to do, and this is unusual to most chefs, I'm going to put right now, at the very beginning of it, the addition of the sage. And here we go with the sage. Sage is a very fall-like fresh herb, which has such a seductive and wonderful aroma. And as this is cooking together, the aroma right here, mmm, it feels like my home, my childhood home. What I'm about to tell you next is a bit of a secret. But before I even start browning the meat, what I'm going to do to this, I'm going to add the prosciutto. Instead of cutting the prosciutto in fine strips, as you've seen me done in previous shows, what I've done, I've gone to the deli and I've asked him to cut me a thick slice of prosciutto, which then I have diced very finely myself. And you'll see exactly what I mean as I add it. Look at that. If you don't have prosciutto handy, bacon will do. And if you actually have access to another Italian deli meat called uh, pancetta, which is an Italian version of bacon, only much more peppery, much more full of flavor, they would even do great. But let me ask you, why is it that we're doing this? What is this and why is it important? I always like to ask people, why do you do that? How come it's done this way? What is it taking you? The reason is that right now, the pork meat that's in there is relieving its flavor into it. Its fat, its, its spices are going into the sauce, building up step by step all these layers of flavors. Once we add the meat and we start to get the meat browning into it, the meat will already have found a base to which it will find itself connected to and it will expand. People always say, Nick, but what do you use to different types of meats? To me, 
Three different types of meats are three different flavors that you bring in. If you want to, you can just use beef. It's not a problem. But the combination that I use over the years has become my favorite. Try it that way. You'll like it. Also, let's add some more garlic to it. Slice thick as we have it right here. It'll give us exactly what we want. Now I want you to pay attention to my weapon of choice. Is this beautiful wooden instrument, almost with a, with a wooden blade. Why do I like it? Well, here we go with the meats. If we walk away, we make three enormous meatballs. This is not good for us. We need to bring this to sauce consistency. How do we do it? Two things. First, you push down flat, exactly like this, each of them. You see, you have to do this. If you don't do this, we are in trouble. And then you start using this piece to break it down in smaller pieces. As you can see, we have broken down the big chunks of meat that we have into smaller pieces. We don't need to brown them, we just want to break it down and this is the exact consistency that we want to have. What happens next is a pure bit of artistry. I would refer to this as the kind of thing that men like me like to do for a hobby. You know why I like to cook? It's because it relaxes me. Sometimes, just like anyone else, I get a bad day. Cooking puts me at peace with the world. Tomato paste. Why is tomato paste so important? Why do we use it? It creates almost a glaze that at this point imbues itself into the meat. I love this part of it. And what I like about it is that as it finds itself connecting to the heat, it starts melting. The meat starts to pick up the flavor. You notice that so far we added no salt and no pepper. There is plenty of that already into the prosciutto that we used at the base. Always adjust for salt and pepper toward the end. It guarantees the fact that you get exactly the amount that you like. There's nothing worse than a fantastic sauce that's over salted. It's just like, uh, it makes you suffer, it makes you want to cry. Now, the next step is just as important as everything that I told you so far, and that is the addition of wine. You can do white wine if you want to, but if you're anything like me, and if you like real wine for this particular sauce, it is red. Incre increase the heat. Now, you want to see this one going down almost to a glaze. As the wine goes to a glaze, the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to add the stock. Let's talk about the stock for a moment. There is a choice of stocks that you can use. Obviously, fish stock is not even a point. Vegetarian stock, are we kidding me? That doesn't belong with meat. So we have chicken stock, beef stock. This combination of meats is strong enough to take beef stock very well and would do a fantastic job with that. I don't know why, but I find the chicken stock is a more malleable stock, something that plays nice with everybody and does not make a stance, especially if you make a, a, a beef stock, very strong, it would kind of, veal stock is almost too strong for this, you know, it's too glossy, too heavy, that's why I use chicken stock. You talk to another chef, you get another answer. So here we go. We bring the chicken stock, then together to that, we add that tomato sauce to give it a nice, beautiful color that the sauce will have for us. At this point, what I want you to do is to bring this to a boil. Once you bring this to a boil, I want you to reduce it down to a simmer and simmer it for about 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, I want you to do two things. I want you to add the bay leaf right in the middle of it, a fresh bay leaf, beautiful and green. I have one in the back uh, garden of my house and that's exactly what I did. And then I want you to add peas. Peas is the secret ingredient that makes this particular recipe bolognese. It's in the style of Bologna to have the peas. And then you want to braise this for an additional 15, 20 minutes until this gets sauce-like consistency. Let's talk about what is sauce-like consistency. Let me show you. We go from a very full pot just like this, very liquid, to something that's much thicker. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, as reduced by our full third, you see the sauce nice, thick, explosive with flavor. This is exactly what we want. In just a moment, I'm going to show you exactly how to mix this with the pasta and to cook it to perfection, to the point that this will become your signature dish. Let me clean up and I'll show you exactly what I need. follows next is the simplest part. Follow me. We have the sauce that we placed in the pan. It's nice and hot. At this point, the pasta has finished cooking exactly the way we wanted it. So drain it out of the pot. Be careful because it tends to leak otherwise. Here we go. Here she is. Now, what do we need to do? We need to make sure that the pasta and the sauce fall in love. And this is how we do it. 
We cook it together. Ah, guarda che combinazione, guarda che bellezza. I have no regard for my shirt, I have no regard for this kitchen. This, this act of love comes first and foremost. Cooking on high heat, just for a few moments until the pasta and the sauce become one and there it is. Pasta al dente, ready to go. Beautiful, I can see it from the color, the way in which the sauce is. This is truly, to me, the picture of my youth. Now, there is one last step that I want to make sure that you all see, and that is the adding of the cheese to the pasta. As we add the cheese, the one thing that we want to do is first put it out on top, like this. Then there is one more addition, which is not from the town of Parma. This is a Stellino touch, pepper. I like to put a nice amount of pepper. If you can ground it fresh right on top of it, it would even be much better. What I like is the extra bite that it takes. One more flip, uno, due. Tre. Mamma mia, sono proprio bravo. Mi piaccio. For those of you that don't speak Italian, when I say that, I'm really good. I like myself. <laughs> My wife catches me from time to time when I say that. I says, what, are you crazy? And I go, well, you marry me. I must be. Now, don't exaggerate with this pasta. Trust me when I tell you, a good amount of pasta is roughly what I will show you. If you go beyond this, it's too heavy. It's very rich. The sauce is very, very powerful. There it is. We could put parsley on top of it. We could put basil on top of it. But why mess something that looks as beautiful? The only thing you want to do is simply take a little bit of freshly grated Parmesan cheese, sprinkle it from height so it falls exactly light, light, light. You do not want to obsess about it. Signori e signori, Believe me when I tell you, this is my recipe for rigatoni with bolognese ragù, or as we say in Italian, rigatoni con il ragù alla bolognese. And there it is. Strawberries. I love strawberries. Whenever I think about strawberries, the first thing that comes to mind to me is summer. As a matter of fact, the prime season for strawberries, when they are the sweetest, their peak is between April and July. Uh, strawberries are very sweet. The Latin name of strawberries is Fragaria ananasa. What a name. Say that 10 times if you can. You know, they were grown commercially for about uh, 300 years. But strawberries have been around in the diet uh, for a long, long time. There are records of Romans using them in their diets. But why is it that I love strawberries? There are some health benefits about strawberries that in my maturity I've come to embrace full heartedly. There was a study that was made that basically has proven that on the top 50 foods that you can possibly have with the biggest amount of antioxidant, strawberries are right at number 27. They are fantastically tasting. They are something that you can eat raw, you can mix with sugar, you can mix with wine, and truly make something light and festive just about any day of the week. As a matter of fact, when I look for strawberries, I look for a nice, deep, red, shining color, something that immediately suggests the ripeness that will be on the inside. This is absolutely perfect for me. Nobody's looking. I'm taking this, bringing it to the kitchen, and I'll show you to make a dessert that will forever change your culinary diet. Why? Because it's so good, you'll make it every day. Come here with me in the kitchen. Zabaglione. Zabaglione. Most people call it Zabaglione. You know, you can call it that way if you want to, but Italian call it Lione. G-L reads Lione. In spite of the fact that it sounds so difficult, just that name alone, <laughs> it's actually very easy to make. But you need to understand what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. So what I wanted to show you is a technique, a flow, a series of tools, and how to organize yourself in the kitchen to make a dish that's very simple, but at the same time, it's truly spectacular. It only uses very simple ingredients. We have strawberries, sugar, egg yolks, and a little orange liqueur. Put together in the fashion and the flow, which I will share with you, you will be astonished. Now come with me. Let's take a look at these strawberries. They're beautiful. You know, I bought them at the market. They're fantastic. They say organic. And uh, how should we treat these particular beauties? When we handle the strawberries, I want you to do two things. Cut the bottom off. Say, why? Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm trying to tell you a story. Don't ask me so many questions. My wife says, Nick, but nobody's talking to you. You're alone. You're on television. But in my head, I have all sorts of questions and answers that I want to give you. Now, next thing you do, cut them in half. Then you cut them in quarter. You cut them in half. You cut them in quarter. Same with the other one. Now watch what happens as I open the strawberries. These were very fresh. They were bought this morning at the market. You see the white on the inside? Do you see the white on the inside? 
Do you see the white on the inside? This is something terrible that happens to all of us, all around the country. I don't care if you're on the East Coast, if you're on the West Coast. This, unfortunately, is a problem that we do have, that in spite of the fact that fruit is labeled fresh and farm-grown, sometimes they're taken out of the field before they have ripened properly. The white that you see in the inside is the sign that this was not done correctly all the way through. It was simply shipped to market a little bit too early. Why was it, that, by the way, that I cut it in quarters? Why was it that I did not cut it in slice? Why was it that I did not dice it? We're going to put a series of ingredients, one of which has an acidic uh, content to it, and that is the orange liqueur, just a splash of it. We want to give it a bit of a flavoring. The orange liqueur will allow us to extract the juices of the strawberry, but still the strawberries are not as sweet as they should be. So how are we going to make sure that the strawberries taste the way that Mother Nature wanted them to taste? And this, this is the solution that I have for you. By the way, I've used it forever. It's fantastic. Sugar, an abundant amount of sugar. You put it on top, you want to actually now mix them together just like this. You'll see that the sugar completely disappears before you very eyes before you know what's taking place. There is a chemical reaction that is taking place. The acidity containing the liqueur is drawing out the juices. The juices are meeting with the sugar. The sugar and the juices combine into the making almost of a saucy-like liquid, which will give just to this particular part of the dish a wonderful impact. You will see what I, I want to show you later on. Simple technique, one, two, three, but truly creates a wonderful yield. Let's talk about the next most important thing. When you get to this, you want to have all of your ingredients already laid out. And I'm saying this because many times I teach classes and people say, you know, I tried to do this and then I was trying to do the eggs. Uh, once you get going, all you want to have is the egg yolks already separated. They must be separated. Because if you try to do them as you put together the dessert, one of the biggest problems that will happen is that you don't have enough egg yolks in the bowl on the double boiler. And on top of it, one will coagulate, will harden up, and by the time you add the other one, it's, it's already over. It's finished. The tool that you need is a double boiler. Some of us do have double boiler. I have a collection of them, but that's because I have all sorts of pots and pans. I got pots and pans inside my garage. My wife says, but well, why? I only have one car, but I have warehouses of pots and pans. But most of us don't have all these special tools. So one of the things that I like to do is to make techniques that are very simple. A double boiler works on a concept where the water underneath is rolling, not at a boil, but at a gentle simmer for the making of this. What I do in this particular case, I take a glass bowl that you can find anywhere and I place it right on top of it. The glass bowl in this particular case now is acting as a lid to the heat that's coming from underneath and it's starting to coat with heat the bottom of it. It's a gentle cooking process. It's going to be caressing things. Now, what is it that we want to do next? The next thing that we want to do is add the egg yolks. But as we add the egg yolks, what is the goal that we're going for it? Many times, if you understand what you're going for, what is that you're trying to create and the final yield that you're looking for, then you know how to flow into this process. So the one thing they want to do is to put the egg yolks right in here. More often than not, in the old days, this old recipe was done with this particular whisk. This whisk is wonderful. It's fantastic. It's of great quality. I love it. I use it more often than not for many recipes, but not for this one. Do you remember the movie with uh, I think it was with Pacino that says, welcome, meet my little friend. This guy is unbelievable. So, this is what I'm gonna do now. We want to break him up first. Actually, it's almost too powerful. We want to break him up with, and we want to make sure that they start to open up. As the heat gets from underneath, the eggs are trying to cook, but they cannot cook all the way through because it's a soft, long, prolongated heat. And then what you want to do, as the eggs are starting to ask to finally yield onto it, you want to add sugar. And as you add the sugar, you're actually building this particular recipe a little bit at a time. I have the bowl right next to me. We're putting it through, we're putting it through, we're building it even more. Look at this. The sugar is now mixing together with the eggs. The eggs and the sugar are starting to create the volume. This will take you several minutes, but I want you to pay close attention to the mixture that we have in the bowl, because this mixture is going to triple in size with the gentle heat coming from underneath, forcing the eggs to absorb and to close up. The eggs, what they're doing, they're trapping air. The air is brought in from the whisking that we have. This whisking has a very important structure in the making of this recipe. It's a very precise, very simple recipe, but the technique is mandatory. You need to have this constant flow. I'm gonna stop for a second, I wanna show you something.
You see, right now they're still liquid. I want you to focus on this. As they're so liquid, they're not ready to be called zabayon. Zabayon is once the egg move up. Let me continue with this and let me show you exactly what I mean. Now, we basically are at midpoint, and I wanna show you the growth that has been and the change of the texture. We are halfway through, but look at this. I'm gonna put my finger in here. You see now, we have a nice, you see the streaming coming down, this ribboning? This is the proof of what we're going at. This is the point where you want to add the next ingredient. The next ingredient is the personality that I wanna give it, and that's the orange liqueur. Some of you do not handle alcohol well. You cannot have it in your food. You can do without. This is fantastic as it is. But if you can't afford to have it, please do. And orange liqueur in this particular recipe makes a perfect match. Use the same brand of what you actually marinated the strawberries in. Now we get to the point that the consistency is exactly it. It's full of bubbles, it's full of air. This is zabayone, the way zabayone is meant to be. Look at this, you have to see it. I'm gonna put my finger in here again, you see it? Nice, flowing, it's gorgeous. Mamma mia, I'm good. Follow me. These are the strawberries that I mixed before. In the marinade, you can already see it glistening. These are the juices, the natural juices that are coming right out of the strawberries. Okay, I made a big mess. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna clean up real fast. When I come back, I'm gonna show you how to play this dessert. And this is a great idea for you to do at your next party. Okay, this is how we do it when we serve lots and lots of people. You want to have all of your ingredients ready and then almost smooth through in an assembly line. This is going to be great also at home when you have your guests. If all of this is done and ready to go, finally when you put it out, you will thank me forever. Let's take a look at the strawberries. You get to see what happened. Check this out. Strawberries have lost even more of the juice. You see down at the bottom, that is so glossy. This is fantastic. This is the sauce that comes with it naturally. Now, let me move the strawberries away. This is what I like to serve them in, a martini glass. Why? It's so much fun. Watch this. Martini glass gives us several advantages. First and foremost, it spreads everything wide. Then it leaves enough that it makes it easy with a small spoon or a fork as you start to eat it to kind of get into it and really enjoy it. Don't be silly when you do this at home. This bowl is very, very hot. So what I've done with this bowl, I put it on something of a trivet underneath that prevents it from either burning the surface underneath or burning anything else that you might have. Don't touch it with your hand. So I have a spoon. I'm gonna take this and I bring it right here. And watch what happens as I put it right in. This to me is what beauty is all about. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. You see, guarda, guarda che bellezza. See, now what you're seeing is it's a bayone penetrating all the layers of the strawberries. It's marrying with them. It's nice and thick sauce. This egg-based sweetness is the price for you working so hard. I know that I should be looking at you, but I'm looking at the zabayone saying to myself, should I really give it to them? I don't think so. Maybe I'll keep it to myself, but I don't. You must be generous with everything that's beautiful. One last attachment is maybe one little leaf of mint on top. Maybe two to create the perfect combination of this flower that we just created. And zabayone, the strawberry and orange liqueur. And there it is. Dear friends, thank you for joining me once again. I hope you enjoyed the recipes that we shared with you. Rigatoni with bolognese ragu and strawberries with zabaglione and orange liqueur. I hope you'll share this with your friends. I hope you'll make it for your family. And I hope that you will too turn your home into your favorite restaurant. Until next time, arrivederci. We are so accustomed to see green beans at a local supermarket, we never actually wonder where they come from. They come from a beautiful plant like this, gorgeous and green. 
beans like these at the pods, they grow right off to this plant. It takes about six weeks before you can start harvesting the beans from this plant, and a plot of land like this, about eight by 10, can feed a whole family. In its prime, at its very best, you can almost get a full gallon of beans from this little plot of land. What I love about it is also the fact that it's an activity that you can do with your family and showing your children how the land is important to us, to our world, and how much better the flavor is of these fresh beans that come from the labor that we put together.